first of all, in verses 1 through 5, for himself. And in his prayer, in his prayer, we will discover something. Secondly, beginning in verse 6, he prays for his disciples specifically. I personally believe that in that prayer for his disciples are some valuable truths for you and I. And then he makes a special third prayer. He prays for us. He prays for us. I I, I want us to focus on that for just a moment. Uh, If Jesus were here in body and you could ask him to pray for you, what would you ask him to pray for? Now, be careful what you're thinking about asking him to pray for. Because he will pray for what you want. You may not get it, (laughs) but he will pray for you. What would you want him to pray? As he focuses upon you, as he focuses upon me, I want to tell you right now, Jesus is praying for you. Not only in this passage we just read, but he's literally praying for you. The Bible says in Romans 8 and Hebrews chapter 7 that he ever lives to make intercession for us. That's praying for us. There's not a moment of your waking, sleeping life as a child of God but what Jesus is praying for you. Amen. Isn't that wonderful? When nobody else is praying for you, Jesus is praying for you. He says in those passages in Romans 8 and Hebrews chapter 7, he ever lives to make intercession. And so this prayer in John chapter 17 for you and for me was just the tip of the iceberg. He's constantly praying. Even last night when you slept, he prayed for you. He prayed for you. He prayed for you. And we need to be thankful for that. Someone has said, and I want to quote this concerning John chapter 17. The 17th chapter of the Gospel of John is without doubt the most remarkable portion of the most remarkable book in all the world. I wish we really had time to get into this this morning, verse by verse, word by word. It is so powerful. I want to say to you this morning, and I want you to hear me carefully, we are about to enter upon holy ground. We are about to enter upon holy ground. It is a sacred moment that we would even think about considering this passage of Scripture. And to read it is to know, let us know that we're upon holy ground. To hear it, it is to let us know that we're upon holy ground. Listen, Jesus is praying to God, His Father, for us, for us. Number one, if you're taking notes, Jesus' prayer for Himself gives us an insight to his prayer for you and for me. His prayer for himself in verses 1 through 5 gives a tremendous insight to his prayer for us. There are in in this passage, in his prayer for us, for himself, three pleas of Jesus. Father, he says. It speaks of relationship and it speaks of affection. Did you catch the tone of Jesus' father? Now remember, he's about to die. Remember, he is headed toward Calvary, Golgotha's hill, to die for your sins and my sins and the sins of the world. And he stops and he begins to pray with his disciples as they walk with him. And this is going to be the last walk other than those few who would gather around the cross and stand there and watch him die. This would be the last walk for many of them. And so Jesus, as he walks with them, I really sense in my spirit that he stops along the path and he begins to pray to God. And he prays for himself. Why would he do that? Because he wants to be in the presence of God first before he prays for his disciples and before he prays for you and I. This this word, Father, is a very intimate word. He was his father in eternity past. He was his father, the father that sent him from eternity into this world to live like a man and die more than like a man. (laughs) Die a death that no man has ever died before. And so God was precious to Jesus. And he uses a very precious, intimate term, father. Father speaks of his relationship and his affection. Listen. 
Your relationship to God affects every area of your life. However it is right now, it's affecting every area of your life. If it's not good, it's still affecting every area of your life. If it's not as intimate as it ought to be, it's still affecting every area of your life. Your relationship with God affects you all over. Can you say amen this morning? Amen. It does. And Jesus is feeling, now listen to this, Jesus is feeling the intimacy of his Father in this approaching hour of crucifixion, the most awesome, terrible death that any mortal has ever died. And he stops and he says, Father, Father, Father. Notice the second word. The hour has come. The hour has come. His sufferings, his death, and his resurrection. He's speaking to God, his Father, and he says, Father, Papa, the hour is here. It has finally arrived. And I'm crying out to you. I'm crying out to you. In the hour of your trials, dear Christian, there is the power of your God. Can you say amen? In the hour of your trials, in the hour of your pain, in the hour of your disappointment, there is the power of God. And Jesus understood that. And as he faced the hour that has come, he wants to know the power of his God. His Father. And thirdly, he says, Father, would you glorify your Son? Glorify me in my suffering, my death, so I can glorify you. That was the point of Jesus' life upon this earth, was to glorify God. That's your purpose and my purpose for being here, is to glorify God, none other. None other. And so he says, glorify your Son. Glorify me in my coming suffering and in my death. So in turn, in all of this and through this, I can glorify you. I can praise you. I can love you. I can rejoice in what's happening to me. And I can rejoice in you. I can rejoice in you. And then he said these words. This is eternal life. The way to eternal life is to know God through Jesus Christ. Verse 2 says, I shall give them eternal life. And so in his prayer for himself, he's accentuating the purpose of his living and the purpose of his dying. And the purpose of his rising from the dead and his purpose in going back to his Father in heaven. And so he's emphasizing that. And he's, he's reminding us as we read this that eternal life comes through God and his Son, Jesus Christ. You can't have it any other way. It doesn't come by merit and deserving it. It doesn't come by working for it. It doesn't come by living good enough to be accepted by God. None of us can do that. There's been none good but one. Jesus Christ is his name. And so all of our righteousness, the Bible says, are as filthy rags. And so at very best, we must depend upon our God. And he says, I, I come to give eternal life. I want you to know this is my gift to you. As he prays to the Father, aren't you grateful this morning that he's saying, God, I'm grateful that I can give eternal life for those who will believe in me. My hour has come. And it's the hour of giving eternal life through my death. I will die. So others can live. So others can live. The way to bring God glory is to do what he put you here to do. He said, Father, I want you to be glorified. Do you desire for God to be glorified in your life? Then I suggest that you get busy in doing what God sent you here to do. <laughs> and I need to get busy doing that. The way he is glorified is doing what he sent us here to do. Notice the words of Jesus in verse 4. He says, Father, I finished the work. I finished the work. Do you know that you have a work to do in your life? Do you know that you have a purpose here upon this earth? Something to finish and complete? And listen, I'm going to tell you something. I'll tell you exactly when you're going to die. You're going to die when God's ready for you to die, number one. And secondly, you're going to die when you finish what God has sent you here to do. That'd be no reason for you to stay otherwise. <laughs> Do you understand that God could have taken you out of the world the moment you got saved and took you to heaven? But he saw fit to do otherwise. He left you here. Why? That you may glorify him in, in your life, in your work, in everything, everything that you have, everything that God has blessed you with. 
your, your purpose here is to glorify, to finish the job that God has sent you here to do. And look at verse 5. Jesus had humbled himself before God, his Father. And now he requests that God would glorify him with the glory he had before in eternity past he's referring to. You see, he existed with the Father in eternity past before he became a man and came to this earth. And now he's saying, Father, the hour has come and I finished the work. I'm going to die now and I'm praying that you would glorify me with the glory I had with you in the very beginning. You see, he left that for you and for me. He left it all. And now he's hungering to have that glory with his Father. There's no glory without humility. No glory. The second thing I want to leave with you, and we're going to close very shortly. I want to give it to you fast, so buckle your seatbelt, okay? Beginning in verse 20, Jesus prays seven things for you. First of all, he prays in verse 11 for your preservation. He prays for your preservation. Father, I pray that you would keep them. I want you to preserve them. Do you know you have the preserving power of God in your life right now? That's why you haven't died. <laughs> That's why you haven't died. He prays for your preservation. This shows the value that Jesus sets upon you and the interest he has in you. Father, preserve them. Keep them. Keep them. You are God's love gift to his son. God's love gift to his son. You are kept by the power of his name, Jesus Christ. In John chapter 10, verse 28, Jesus says, I give unto them eternal life, and no man can pluck them out of my Father's hand. I want to share something with you this morning. There's no way you can lose your salvation. If you've got it, you've got it. Amen? <laughs> if you don't have it, you don't have it. It's either you've got it or you don't have it. It's not a matter, uh, are you saved forever? Uh, that's a given. <laughs> that's, that's a no-brainer. Because Jesus said in John 10, 28, I give unto them eternal life, and no man shall pluck them out of my Father's hands. They will in no wise perish. You are safe. The Bible says you are in God. Christ is in God. You are in Christ. And the Holy Spirit has come to seal your redemption in all of that. Now, if you can break loose of that, see me after the service. <laughs> I want to tell you how wrong you are. <laughs> you can't do that. In order for the devil to get to you and get your salvation, he's going to have to break the seal of the Holy Spirit, which he can't do. Secondly, he's going to have to get to Jesus, which he can't do because he couldn't do in the wilderness temptations. And Jesus said, it is, not, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone. He tried every trick in the book. By the way, he uses the same tricks today used in that passage in the temptation of Jesus in the wilderness. Hasn't changed his method of operation. Why? Because it works. And so he would have to get to Jesus, then he would have to get to God. And he can't do any of that. And Jesus has prayed for you, and he prays for your preservation. I pray that you would keep them, keep them in all circumstances, in all circumstances. Turn with me in your Bible to the book of Romans chapter 8. I love this passage in Romans chapter 8. It is one of the most powerful passages in all of the Word of God about our salvation and the assurance of our salvation. Verse 35 of Romans chapter 8. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or darkness, distress, persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are killed all the day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Yet in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded. Now listen to this list. Neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created being shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Jesus Christ. Give him praise in the house of God this morning. Amen. Amen. Give him praise. Give him praise. I love things that are preserved. Now, don't you think about that for a moment. I don't eat anything but what it's preserved. <laughs> because if it's not preserved, it's not good. It's not good. And Jesus says to the Father, Father, preserve them in all circumstances, in all situations. Nothing. Nothing. And if it were, Paul was so adamant in this, he, he wanted to cover all the bases, and he said, and any other creature. <laughs> 
and any other creature cannot separate us from the love of God in Jesus Christ. Wow. Secondly, he prays for your joy in verse 13. The joy he had at this time is joy in the midst of suffering and death. That is a tremendous thing. You cannot go through suffering and you cannot go through death without the joy of the Lord Jesus in your heart. The joy of fellowship with the Father he's speaking of. The same joy he had with the Father. You have to step into that, beloved. Beloved. If you want that joy, you have to step into that joy by faith, and you have to walk in it. It's not something that automatically happens. You have it, yes. But a lot of people have the joy of the Lord, but they don't exhibit the joy of the Lord. They don't smile. They're not happy. They're not content. They're not at peace. And Jesus said, I'm praying for your joy. Joy triumphs over every circumstance. How are you doing today? Some of you have said to me, not too good, preacher, under the circumstances. Well, get out from under the circumstances. <laughs> You're not supposed to be under the circumstances. You're supposed to be on top of the circumstances. How can you be on top of the circumstance? You can be on top of it because the joy of Jesus exudes in your life. Amen? Amen. That excites me. Whew. I'm having pain right now, but I have more joy and I've got pain. <laughs> and it's the joy of Jesus. It's the joy of Jesus. He said, Father, give them the same joy that you and I have. Wow. In this church, if we could have that joy, just bottle it up and drink from it again and again, and we can. It's, it's, a, it's a volitional thing with us. We've got to decide to do that. Listen, if you don't decide to be positive, you will be what? Negative. Yeah. Yeah. Some people are so negative. If they were to walk in a dark room, they would develop instantly. <laughs> Some of you, that just flew right by you. By the time you get to your car in the parking lot, it'll dawn on you. Okay. All right. Turn your negativism into joy. Let the joy of the Lord be your strength. He says, Father, Father, give my children joy. The happiest people on the earth ought to be God's children. Amen? Amen. Thirdly, in verse 15, he prays for your deliverance. He prays for you to be delivered from the evil one, Satan. He prays for you to be delivered from his power. Here's the key to our dependency upon God. That's the key to our deliverance. We don't have time to go there, but in 2 Chronicles chapter 20, verse 12, the children of Israel were being defeated tremendously. And they said, we don't know what to do, but God, here we stand before you, and we will turn our eyes upon you, and we will look to you because you, your name is over this house, and you live in this house, and we will stand before you in the hour of our trial. And that's how they got deliverance. That's how they got deliverance. He says, Father, in verse 15, deliver them. And then fourthly, in verse 17, he says, I pray for your sanctification. Don't let that word scare you. Uh, do you know that you're a saint of God? Now, I know you're like me. Sometimes you don't act saint saintly. <laughs> and I don't sometimes. I mess up just like you do. But the Bible tells me that I am a saint of God and that I have been sanctified. Jesus prays for our sanctification. What does that mean? It means to be set apart unto God. Father, would you set my children apart unto you? Set apart by redemption, set apart by the truth of his word, and set apart by the Holy Spirit. And he prays for our sanctification. Listen, church, we've got to be set apart from the world. And the world has got to be able to look at us and see us in that set apart condition and state. Amen? If they don't see that, they'll see nothing that they desire of what we have, of what we have. And he says, Father, set them apart. And then he prays for our unity in verse 21. In this passage, unity is mentioned five times, and I find that very interesting. It is a mystical union, by the way. How do you define unity? Uh, how do you express unity? Uh, how, do, how do you not only define it, but how do you uh, embrace it in your heart? Uh, it, it's, it's the unity, it's a mystical union that Jesus had with God the Father in eternity past. Uh, it's born of who God and Jesus were in eternity past. And Jesus is the same, Father, <laughs> Father, as we are one, as we are one, make them one. Make them one. Do you know something this morning? I want to share this with you. It's yet to be manifested upon this earth, this unity. 
Because the world doesn't believe that he's been sent yet. And you know why they don't believe? Because